Hi, Anissa here with Firehouse Education and this week's Ask Anissa video column. And this week, what I'm going to do is answer a series of questions that several of you have either texted, posted on social media, or emailed me while um, I was on a recent fire job. As you may know, I do travel some and help people when it comes to doing like coming on site and doing training. And there was a really great company that had a very large, uh, their first really large uh, fire pack out job. And so they had us come out and work with them on site and do packing out. You may have seen some other videos on my YouTube channel and uh, the inventory, this sort of thing. And I did some videos and some live on Facebook as well on the Firehouse Education page that you might wanna go check out if you haven't seen. So the questions that came in I thought were really good. And so I kind of compiled probably the three biggest questions that I was asked and that I also think are uh, the most important uh, for you to know. So one of those questions that came in, um, I think it was from Jeremy on Facebook. But anyway, um, Jeremy had asked about what kind of PPE gear did you need to have on a fire job? What I want to talk about is the, because I really can't answer that question unless I'm on a particular job to know exactly what kind of PPE gear that you need to wear, because it's going to depend on the job. However, I will tell you this, I see way too many people in fire jobs without any PPE gear on. I mean, at a bare minimum, they don't even have gloves on their hands and they're touching things that are, you know, covered with soot and stuff. And that's really not safe. There's a lot of VOCs and a lot of different um, things that are released in the air when you have a fire, especially if there's any, you know, uh, man-made material burn, which, hello, there generally is, uh, plastics and wiring and walls. And this particular job we were on was a garage fire. So there was a ton of chemicals that burned in that fire. So it was really important to have proper PPE gear. And fire PPE gear can include all of, I mean, it can be everything from booties and gloves to white Tyvek suits or the, you know, yellow Tyvek suits that are more impenetrable. Um, and um, it can include full face respirators, um, safety goggles, and made along with half masks, depending on the situation that you're in. So it's just really, really important that you not that you understand what the proper PPE gear is. So um, if you're not uh, already have your crews fit tested with uh, full face respirators, you absolutely should because every, cert every person who's gonna work on a fire job should have the ability to wear one of those and more than likely they're gonna be wearing them, especially when it comes to the pack out uh, and that sort of thing. Once you get into your cleaning warehouse, if you're cleaning the contents, it's a little bit different story. Okay, so the second question that I got asked a lot was how do you keep all of the things straight? How do you handle the magnitude of log destroyed and, and, and you know, inventorying all of the boxes so that things don't get mixed up and that sort of thing? Well, definitely, um, definitely, definitely important. I cannot stress enough to be detailed when it comes to inventorying your items before you remove them from a fire, um, including the log to story, that's very important. What I always like to tell people and students is if you think you're being ridiculous and overly um, detailed, then you're probably doing it right, okay? <laughs> so detail, detail, um, having systems in place, you know, so that you've got check boxes to know how you're handling items going through the flow is huge and important as well, so that you're not misplacing boxes or items. The other thing is your photo inventory. And you know, um, there are a lot of programs out there and I'm actually checking into one that I'm very excited. Hopefully soon I can talk to, with you about, but I have a little bit more to do with learning that program um, as far as the inventorying goes. In the meantime, you can set up a Microsoft Word document to be able to track your cleaned inventory that you're logging in your box numbers. You wanna track box numbers and box sizes and by the room. Everything is by the room when you're dealing with a fire job, especially, you know, when you're dealing with the content side, especially. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of programs out there that do great. There's Matterport. There's, there's 
all, several programs that you can do video inventory or video taping, if you will, to you know, look at a job and, and get a, sort of an inventory of where everything is at. It's very important that whether you do that or you just do your own digital camera situation, do it before anything is touched. Don't touch anything and take it out of a room or move it even in a room until all of that photo inventory is done so that you have a record of what was there, where everything was before you came in and touched anything on the job. Trust me, it, you'll thank me for that later if you ever have someone say, hey, this was in a room and now it's not there. When you go back to your original photographs, you will know whether it was in that room or not and exactly where that item was setting. So that's really, really important. So being uber detailed, ridiculously meticulous is how you keep from messing up your inventories and losing an item, okay? So the third question <clears throat> that I get asked so much is, how much can you make on a, on a contents job? Or you know, how do you bill out a contents job? Well, okay, that's kind of a two-part question. So I'm gonna talk about the how to bill out uh, in a second. But when it comes to how much can you make on a content job, that's like asking how many miles per gallon does the average car get? You To average it is really difficult and to say how much you can make on a content job has so many variables that you know it depends on the size of the job, how much was log destroyed, how much did you wind up cleaning, you know, how many are specialty items and how many special contractors do you have to, or applications do you have to you know, put into the job to clean it? Uh, the, how many items someone has in their house? You can have two houses, both 2,000 square feet, and to have both very, very different amounts of contents in them. So you'd have very different amounts of billing for a content job in that scenario. So it is easy to say an average profit percentage. Now that's a different story and that's a better conversation to have. You know, profit margins, I average 65 to 72% when it comes to content cleaning, whether it's pack out or clean in place matters. I actually do better on a profit percentage when it comes to clean in place. So those are really the kind of numbers I think that are more important. But you know, you can get one content job that's a clean in place with no pack out and it's, you know, 10 grand and you can get another content job that's $60,000. So there's a lot of variable there. What you need to know is what is your profit percentage on each and every job and know that you're in a good healthy average there. Okay, so the second part of that third question I wanted to talk about was how I bill. Now some of you heard me talk about this before, but I, again, that was one of the most popular things that people asked me, so I wanted to have a conversation here with you about it. I bill kind of what I like to call a hybrid. Now, some people bill strictly one way or the other. They go buy the item, buy the box, T&M, buy the hour, and plus materials. I kind of do a hybrid. So it depends on the item. I may bill by the item. Um, I, I rarely ever, ever would bill by the box. Um, in fact, off the top of my head, I can't even think of a scenario where I would just be billing by the box. There might be if it was maybe just some, a small pack out and it was just some average kitchen items, that sort of thing, I might. But generally I do a buy the item, I do time and materials, and then I do what I call percentage of value, okay? So kind of mixing that up, and also I do sometimes use a specialty contractor like a piano person or a grandfather clock person or a taxidermist. So then I would put their invoice plus um, O&P 10 and 10 on top of their invoice in my bill and bill for that. So I kind of do a hybrid and I've never had a problem with my bills. I just don't and I've done contents all across the country. And I think that part of the biggest reason is that I, I'm very detailed in my explanation of everything, and I also get them their bill very fast, which usually blows their mind. Oftentimes, content billing doesn't come in for several months, and I usually get it to them within seven days so of the job. So they're, they're pretty tickled with that, so they get their claim closed quickly. All right, well, I know I just threw a lot at you, but I really felt it was kind of important. I almost did a live Q&A to kind of talk with everybody about this because I did have so many questions as I said, come in. I'll answer a few more in the up and coming uh, weeks on Ask Anissa, but I just wanted to get this one out to you with those top three that I felt like were really, really important. And if you 
would like to um, check out our services, you can go to firehouseeducation.com where we do have our uh, online training courses and our uh, marketing materials there. If you're interested in having me come out and work a fire job with you, I would love to do that. Uh, just send me an email and we can have a conversation. Uh, my email is anisa at firehouseeducation.com. And don't forget to send me questions. I always love to hear from you guys. And on that note, I will see you on next week's Ask Anissa video column.